his word and for our joy. You're turning to Genesis chapter 21 and 22. Uh, and uh, we have the privilege today, uh, as we continue to work through our series in Genesis, uh, as we point it all to Jesus, the true and better. He's the true and better Adam, the true and better Abel. He's the true and better Noah, the true and better Ark. He's the true and better Tower. He's the true and better Abraham. Uh, all the way through, we are pointing to Jesus because Jesus said, uh, if you believe Moses, you'd believe me because Moses wrote about me. And this is written by Moses. Uh, so we see Jesus here. We finally arrive at the story of the birth of Isaac. And one of the most famous, of course, is the sacrifice of Isaac upon the mountain. Uh, we don't know how old uh, Isaac was. Uh, some suggest he was probably about 13. Uh, so today, uh, you're looking at chapter 22. <laughs> this is my son. Say, hey, Kyle. Yeah. Hey, hey, Kyle. Uh, Kyle turns 13 this year, and uh, Kyle doesn't uh, like to be up here, uh, but uh, I admire him that he uh, is willing to do this. He's going to read a couple of verses of scripture, and he's going to pray for us today, uh, just as this imagery of father and son. Uh, Genesis chapter 22, uh, Kyle, thank you, son, for coming up. Would you read a couple verses and pray? Thank you, son. After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. He said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah, and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. Amen. Would you pray for us, buddy? Dear Lord, thank you for this day. I pray that you will help my dad and put some power and your truth in him, and that this sermon will be great. Amen. 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 Thank you, buddy. Thank you. It's a good man. Uh, before we get started uh, uh, with this passage, uh, we want to celebrate a few testimonies. Uh, last week, uh, we recognized uh, through the story of Hagar. Uh, El Roy, you are the God who sees me. You're the God who sees. Every woman here got a mug. Uh, ladies uh, who got those, did you like those? Uh, did you like those? Uh, here's, here's, uh, one, here's one testimony that came in. Thank you for the mug. They're great. I'll be having coffee in mine every morning. That's my new favorite mug. Uh, El Roy, he's the God who sees you. He knows you. Another testimony came in of a Hagar in our congregation. Love this story. I called it, I stopped running. Uh, she says this, when I came to church on Mother's Day, I was engulfed in the sermon. I felt such a strong connection with Hagar and her running. I have been running from many things with my mental and emotional health, running away from my problems and giving up uh, is what I felt was best. I have been having a rough couple of weeks and running what it was what I was doing during the sermon, hearing how God sought after Hagar and told her to return back to the place she was running from hit me like a ton of bricks. I needed to stop running and face my issues head on. I realized that when I had overdosed on antidepressants that God sought after me and protected me because he was not done with me. Having this passage has been the biggest eye-opener since my overdose. Being that Hagar was doing what I was doing, and I can use this passage as a reminder of God seeking me out. I know God loves me, and I'm to turn to him during tough times. This couldn't have come at a better time when I was in such a dark place. Thank you so much. I don't know where I would be today if I didn't have new hope. Praise God. Put your hands together for that. That's awesome. And, and uh, let me just testify, if, if, uh, if there's folks here that are still running, overdose, opioid addictions, it's a big problem in our area. Run to Jesus. He is the one who sees you, and he can fill you. Uh, one more testimony. I shared this last week, but now we have an action step, and, and uh, this, uh, today the sermon is not going to move forward until this happens. I'm so excited about this moment. 
Here's the, the thing I read last week from uh, Captain. Now, this is uh, from the corrections office uh, leader. So, uh, 47 uh, corrections officers uh, who serve at the Grand Traverse County Jail. We had the privilege to put together packets, deliver those to Captain Ritter this week on Thursday. Uh, what a joy it was to spend a few moments with him. So, this was what he said last week. Thank you all for thinking of us, keeping us in your prayers. We've had some really, uh, we had officers really struggle this year dealing with deaths and custody, how the media has portrayed them. For them to see and hear members of the public reaching out to recognize them really means a lot. I cannot even begin to express how much it means to me or how the occasional messages from Craig throughout the year really helped me through the toughest of times. Thank you. Uh, if you support our officers, uh, put your hands together to say thank you because we do. We love our officers. All right, so, uh, so here, here's what I'm excited about. As part of that gift bag, we put in there uh, uh, 10 prayer targets uh, that each of the officers know that we are praying for them, okay? And it occurred to us this week, wouldn't it be awesome if the people of our congregation prayed for them regularly, put your hands together, prayed for them, no, 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 just together, like we're praying, prayed for them regularly, and wrote them quarterly. Put your fingers out. Four. Prayed for them regularly, wrote them quarterly. So here's the deal. I have, on this side, 10 female officer cards with the addresses and the prayer targets. And I have over here on this side 32 uh, names of those officers with the prayer targets. And this service is not going to continue until we get 42 people who are willing to adopt an officer, committing to pray for them regularly and send them notes quarterly. Just for one year, that's all I'm committing to. I only need 42 of you. I'm not going to preach until it happens. So if that's you, stand up uh, and uh, come and get those. Uh, if, if that's you, ladies on this side, some guys on this side. We're not going to, this is, the service is just going to flop until they're all gone. Okay, okay, ladies are gone. Come over here. We have plenty of guys to choose from. If we run out, I have uh, prayer target cards without names of officers. They're almost gone, almost gone. There's three more. Okay, they're gone. Here we go. Start passing those out. Put your hands together. That's awesome. That's so cool. Thank you. Uh, we were told uh, that as the officers opened uh, their bags, of course they had gifts in their bags as well, but we were told uh, that one of the most meaningful parts of the bag was those 10 prayer targets to know that the people of New Hope were praying specifically for them. Isn't that awesome? Praise God for that. That's, that's such a cool thing. All right, so here we go. Now we turn to Genesis chapter 20. Genesis chapter 20, 21, I'm sorry, chapter 21. Here it is, point number one. Look at this. God is faithful to his word in his time for our joy. Everybody say it. God is faithful to his word in his time for our joy. Verse 1 says this, the Lord visited Sarah. Literally, it's a divine appointment. This is a divine thing. Just as the Lord visited Mary, the virgin birth of Jesus Christ, there's a sense here in which the, the, the Lord God visited in a very specific, special way this woman named Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did to Sarah as he had promised. That means this, God's purposes prevail, okay? He's faithful. Uh, God is like, I told you, I told you, right? I told you God is faithful in his time, to his word. Here it is, to his word. Isaiah chapter 14, I love this passage. We prayed this as a staff this week. Isaiah 14 says, as I have planned, so shall it be. And as I have purpose, so shall it stand, for the Lord of hosts has purposed, and who will uh, cancel it, annul it? His hand is stretched out, and who could possibly turn it back? 
What I think is remarkable here is that we've arrived at the point when after all of the seasons of waiting, I hear we have God is faithful to his word. Even in all of life's setbacks, even with all of our false starts, even with our failures, even though Abraham and Sarah, as we have learned, are flawed saints, yes, faithful, but they're flawed saints, we have a God who is faithful to his word, amen? Here's a testimony this week from one of our congregation members. I call it, God has a plan. God does have a plan. Here's a testimony. Uh, here's first the chronology. April, grandbaby was born. May, we opened a business only to receive a, a cease and desist order. June, second granddaughter was born. October, son gets married. November, mom is admitted to the hospital. November, my brother-in-law dies suddenly. December, my mom dies. January, we sold our business. Now, it's just not, go back, go back. You, you see that? Life is hard. Where is God? Well, God is faithful to his word. Here it is. I remember coming to church and you would ask me how I was. I would reply, in the wilderness. <laughs> Ever been there, church? Because I was waiting on God to answer my prayers. It wasn't fun being there. As I look back and remember sitting in my restaurant all by myself, exhausted, crying alone, but I really wasn't alone. God was sitting right next to me, assuring me everything would be okay. But about November, the songs started. She's talking about the songs. God put songs every day in her heart. Almost every morning, I would wake up to a song in my head. It was comforting, soothing, loving. Sometimes it would stay all day. It was from God. God's plan was to put into place way back in November. Uh, it is important to be aware of what God is telling you. He does have a plan. Amen? Amen. For a while, I thought I was like Job, losing everything. But now I see I have gained so much. My life is full, and I have a journey that I look forward to every day. We all have losses to tell in our lives, but what we do with those losses will only make us stronger through God. By the way, I woke up at midnight this morning by the song, He will hold me fast, He will hold me fast, For my Savior loves me so, He will hold me fast. I guess it was my cue to get up and write you this. Put your hands together. That's, a, that's good. He's, he has a plan. God is faithful to his word in his time. Everybody say it. God is faithful to his word in his time. Okay, here we go. Verse 2. And Sarah conceived and bore Abraham his son in his old age at the time of which God had spoken to him. <laughs> it's his timing. He's never early. He's never late. But in the meantime, we wrestle with divine delays. We protest. Do you want to know how long Abraham and Sarah waited for this moment, this joyous occasion? 24 years since the Lord promised them. I talked to a couple this morning Scott and Lisa, they waited uh, five years of infertility and then another four years for their second child. I talked to Jill, waiting for her prodigal to come home. She waited 10 years for that prodigal to come home. What do you do in the waiting? What do you do with divine delays? What do you do when you meander through valleys of doubts and ravines of control and crevasses of fear and failure? How do we handle those? When our plans are stopped, our flights are canceled, and the train is delayed. I saw a news article this week uh, of the uh, New York subway system. Have you ever ridden the New York subway system? It's fascinating. Okay. The New York uh, subway system records this. Every single day, the New York subway system receives 2,500 profanity-laced complaints because people don't like to wait. What do you do when you're waiting? Here's a testimony from this week. I call it, don't force things. Don't force things. Wait. It's amazing what can happen when we wait for God's timing and don't try to force things 
piece by piece, the stories are coming out and the healing is beginning. The pieces are coming together to make a whole picture and a whole family, the forgiveness and healing, amazing. God's gifts are good. That's awesome. That's a woman whose story is coming back together of family unity and family harmony. You can clap and put your hands together and thank her for writing that story. God is faithful. God is faithful to his word in his time, and here it is, for our joy, for our joy. Look at verse 3. Abraham called the name of his son who was born to him, uh, whom Sarah bore him, Isaac, and Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old, as God had commanded him. Abraham was 100 years old when his son Isaac was born. And Sarah said, (laughs) moms, just stop. When you gave birth, what was the first words? Right here, first words. And Sarah said, (laughs) God has made laughter for me. Everyone who hears will laugh over me. And she said, Who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children, yet I have borne him a son in his old age? The key of this whole narrative is father-son, father-son, father-son. It is so compelling as it sets up now the the sacrifice we're going to get to in a moment. It's father-son, this joyfulness, this this, this joy that has now come. We, we've mentioned before, if you missed it, the name Isaac, who God said, hey, you're going to name him Isaac. His name means laughter. The Lord is bringing laughter into a home that has been grief-stricken through years of waiting and trials and grief and difficulty. And Abraham just obeys. That's what he does. He names him Isaac because that's what God commanded. He circumcises Isaac on the eighth day because that's what God commanded. By the way, 2,000 years later, we come to the true and better Isaac, Jesus Christ. He's born of a virgin, and guess what his mom does? His mom names him Jesus because that's the name that the Lord said to give to him, and she also has him circumcised on the eighth day according to the law of Moses. We have the true and better Isaac. But here in this passage, God is working for their joy. God has replaced years of grief with joy. There's a testimony in our church that I love. A family in our church lost their boy. He's 19 years old. They lost him just over six years ago. And just three years ago, this past weekend, Uh, The mom's life was almost lost because of liver failure. So six years ago, losing a son. Three years ago, her life is almost snuffed out, and they've given permission to share this story. But she writes a testimony this week. In the midst of the grief and the trial and the pain and the waiting and all of that, she writes a testimony, and here it is. I call it Over the Moon Excited. Craig, just wanted to pass along a thank you, especially to your daughters who came and prayed with with and for me before I headed to U of M three years ago today. Man, I'm glad I didn't know what was in store and to unfold during the next week. But God knew and sent a miracle just in the nick of time. Thank you for walking with our family through the ups and downs that life can bring. On a positive note, I fly out to help my daughter come back home permanently this Saturday with her husband. And... I'm not sure if you heard, but they're expecting their first child. Of course, we are over, read it, over the moon excited. And to be bringing a beautiful child to our family, praise be to God. Put your hands together, huh? Here's what I want us to see, that God is faithful to his word in his time and for our joy. Say it, God is faithful to his word in his time for our joy. Yes, we all go through seasons of waiting, grief, trials, suffering, difficulty, death, burial. But we take the long view that God is working in his time to his word and for our joy. Let's fast forward 13 years or so. Turn to chapter 22. 
God is faithful. Point number two. This is the part you don't want to hear. <laughs> oh, I'm funny sometimes. <laughs> but tests do come. Let us settle. God is faithful. But tests come. Verse 1. Here it is. I, I go back. I'm sorry. Here's what we're working through. Tests that seem morally questionable, ethically absurd, and supremely illogical. Everything in this passage. It's like, God, what? Verse 1. After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. Moses tells us this is a test, but we know something that Abraham doesn't know. Did you get it? Abraham doesn't know that. All of this, Abraham doesn't know, but we know it. He doesn't know the end of the story. This is a test. It made me think about this week. Uh, roll Q, please. This is a test. This station is conducting a test of the emergency broadcasting system. This is only a test. Okay. Abraham doesn't know that. God tested Abraham. Abraham, yes, Lord, here I am. The author of this test is God. The purpose of the test is to test his faith, his character, his devotion, and his idols. And the test will reveal something. The test will reveal where is God on Abraham's list. I like to say on Craig's list. Where is God on Craig's list? Where, where is God on your list? This is what the test is going to reveal. The test is for Abraham. The funny thing about tests is they don't always seem fair, morally questionable. What? Look at this. He said, verse 2, take your son, your only son, Isaac. Oh, yeah, you, you, love, you love him. And go to the land of Moriah, offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning. That, that's amazing, right? I mean, that's amazing. Immediate, radical, costly obedience right there the next morning. Immediate, radical, costly obedience. So Abraham got up the next morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him, two men, two men with him, keep that in mind, and his son Isaac, and he cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day... Interesting how the scripture is laced with third days. Abraham lifted up his eyes, and he saw the place from afar. Now, this is morally questionable. Pagan gods would say, sacrifice your children. Uh, the gods of Molech, they would offer their children, uh, but not the God of Israel. You guys understand that? The God of Israel doesn't do this. It is morally questionable that God would take a son. We've had people in our congregation who have lost sons. Is there anything more hard than that? The Schofields, Don Trimmer, Don Marker, Sam Marlott, Gordon Russell and Bel Air, Van Stedham's, Deb Zarafa. I texted Deb last night. Her son died Valentine's Day 2006, and she said, it feels like yesterday, but God is good. It's morally questionable. God, what, what are you doing? To Abraham, it seems inconsistent with God's character. Uh, God, if, if, if you're good, why would this happen? Have you ever had somebody ask that? Have you? If God were good, why? short answer is this, I, I don't know. 
Uh, there's no trite answers. I could give you some biblical things, but, but I, you know, I don't know. There, there's things that happen that, are just, that, that seems inconsistent with God's character, but I was so encouraged at least to kind of filter things through a paradigm. It was Ravi Zacharias' ministry that helped. Uh, here's, uh, when you're dealing with dilemmas of suffering, here, here's the three, uh, three circles to kind of think through the, uh, the realms of suffering. Uh, is God all loving? The Christian will say, yes. Is God all-powerful? The Christian will say, yes. Is evil really evil? The Christian will say, yes. Okay, so, so there we have it. It's a dilemma, though, because if he's all-loving and if he's all-powerful, then why evil? And so the Christian, in the midst of this trilemma, this is a trilemma, must insert at the hub of this wheel one thing that is so critical to hold all of it together, and it is this. God is all wise. You get it? This is a paradigm to understand suffering. God is powerful. He is loving. Evil exists. And in the midst of all of it, I don't understand it, but I am going to cling to this fact that God is all wise in what he is doing. This is the moral dilemma. This is the tension that we hold. God is weaving his narrative, but Abraham is obeying with erco, immediate, radical, costly obedience. But not only morally questionable, it's ethically absurd. <laughs> ethically absurd. Look what it says next. Then Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to see you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering. He took the wood and he laid it on Isaac. And he, Abraham, took in his hand the fire and the knife. You get it? The boy carries the wood. The dad carries the knife. So they went, both of them together, and Isaac said to his father, Abraham, My father! <laughs> and he said, Here I am, my son. He said, Behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb? Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they both of them went on together. Seems ethically absurd. A father with a knife, a son carrying the wood, and all of it is bound for a sacrifice. What do you say to your boy when he says, hey, hey, pops, <laughs> hey, pops, where's the lamb? What is Abraham thinking? Wow. We begin to see a picture emerge of Jesus, the true and better. Isaac is the only son of the father, and Jesus is the only son begotten of the father. Isaac has been led up to this point with two other men, and Jesus himself will be led up that hill with two other men, criminals, one on either side. He is led up here, Isaac, to uh, the mountain. It's called Mount Moriah. Uh, we know the mountain. It's the same mountain that we know of as Golgotha. This is Jerusalem. It is the place of sacrifice. Fascinating how the, the, the intertwining of Scripture comes into play here, that they are walking up the mountain to offer a sacrifice upon a mountain which later becomes Jerusalem, which later becomes the temple, which later becomes the very place where Christ the only son bears the punishment. This boy, Isaac, carries the wood. Jesus himself carries the cross. Abraham took the knife, the father. In Acts chapter 2, it clearly says that Jesus was crucified according, get this, according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. The father with the knife. 
And Isaac says, my father, and the son Jesus will say what? He will say on the cross, my, help me, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This ethical absurdity, where is the lamb? Abraham, my son, God will provide. The, the key here uh, to what makes Abraham obey in the midst of ethical absurdity, that I think this is the key. The key in the midst of all of this moral questionableness and ethical absurdity, we don't know the key until the New Testament shines a light back and it talks about Abraham. Hebrews 11 tells us the key. Here's the key to why Abraham is obeying and why he's moving up the mountain with a knife and the wood upon his son's back. Here's Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews 11 gives us a clue. By faith... Everybody say that, <laughs> by faith, okay? Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son. Here is the key. Are you ready? Come on. Thank you. He considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. <laughs> Do you see the key here? The key is, even before the resurrection of Jesus Christ, Abraham had it within him that he served a God of resurrection. That's awesome. The God of resurrection hope. I want to take you back to this family who lost their son just over six years ago, who almost died because of liver failure. And as we gathered at uh, the graveside together six and a half years ago in a February cold winter night, cold winter day, of course, imagine choosing a tombstone for your son. What do you put on it? What do you put on it? What do you put on your tombstone for your son? Here's the tombstone picture, and it has a verse, and then we transcribed it. The verse you can't see, but here's the verse that they put from New Hope on the tombstone. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Isn't that awesome? Put your hands together. That's okay. That's, that's a family who in the midst of grief, by faith, looks ahead to the God of resurrection hope. We will meet again. I'm so proud of them. What a testimony. But this test here, it seems morally questionable, ethically absurd, and it's, it is supremely illogical. Abraham doesn't know it's a test. So here he is. This is illogical, verse 11. Verse 9, rather. When they came to the place of which God had told him, Abraham built the altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. That's important, I think. True and better. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter the son. Stop, stop reading, stop reading. He is going to do it. I was preparing my son to read today, and I, <laughs> he said, Dad, you wouldn't really kill me, would you? <laughs> I said, oh, son, no way. No. Right, parents? Like, no. 
this is amazing. It's the brink of disaster. It's like, uh, it's illogical. But the, the true and better Jesus comes into view. The son, Isaac, is bound. Jesus was bound. The son is laid upon the wood. Jesus was laid upon the wood and pierced for our transgressions. The knife is raised to the slaughter. Now, we know by the end of the story that Isaac will be spared, but for the true and better Jesus, do you know what it says in Romans chapter 8? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Let me say this again. He who did not spare his own son, This is the comparison and contrast of the true and better Jesus whose father did not spare him. But the key is in the faith of the God of resurrection hope. Verse 11, here we go. God is faithful, say it, God is faithful. But tests do come and yet God provides. Here it is, verse 11. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. He said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him, for now I know. (laughs) Now I know, Craigslist, right? Now I know that you fear God, seeing that you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him, (laughs) behind him. What what did he say? Uh, Dad, where's the lamb? I don't know, son, but God will provide. Abraham looks, and behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. Okay, He's caught by the head in a thicket. And Abraham went and he took the ram and he offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. This is sacrificial. This is atonement. This is substitutionary. So Abraham called the name of the place Jehovah Jireh. The Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. He names the mountain Jehovah Jireh, my provider, right? His grace is sufficient for me. That was my solo, thank you, all right? So, so this is Jehovah Jireh. He names the mountain. What did he provide? Well, God provided a substitute, a ram in a thicket. He provided a sacrifice so that the son could live. All of it is true and better Jesus. It is being completed right here. It points the spotlight 2,000 years later to Jesus Christ, who is the true and better substitute. He became sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. He's the true and better lamb. John the Baptist sees Jesus. Behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He is the true and better atonement for our sins. He is the true and better ram who was caught in the thickets by the head. Do you know what the ram was caught in? Thorns. And Jesus is that true and better ram whose head was pierced and caught in the thorns in the thicket. And he did it willingly for you. That's love. And Abraham says, On the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. What did God provide? What does God provide? Think of it. Jehovah Jireh. We sing it. We say it. We often say, Jehovah Jireh, he's, he's going to provide financially. I say, amen, he will be faithful. Jehovah Jireh, he provides family for our enjoyment. Amen, he will. Jehovah Jireh, he provides jobs for wages and to earn a living. Praise God, he does. 
But my friend, this passage is for one purpose of calling him Jehovah Jireh. It is one purpose. One purpose. (laughs) More than anything, Jehovah Jireh has provided a substitute to atone for your sin and mine so that we could be set free. On the mount of the Lord, it will be provided. It will be. And 2,000 years later, on the same mount of the Lord, it was provided. And that offer of forgiveness is available to everybody who calls on the name of the Lord. Is this not good news? God is faithful to his word in his time for our joy. But tests do come. Tests that are morally questionable, ethically absurd, and supremely illogical. But God provides. Why don't you bow your heads? What's your action step today? 30 seconds, what do you need to do? What is God calling you to do? Is there comfort to be received? Is there obedience? Is there sin to confess? Uh, Is there joy to embrace? Is there resurrection hope to be looking forward to? Is there patience in the timing? Uh, Is there waiting that needs to be done with joy and confidence that God is faithful? This is what I pray now every Sunday. I pray now that God would take through his indwelling Holy Spirit and speak a word of specific action to you. God, I praise you today. We praise you today for you are good. Lord, we don't, uh, we don't like tests, admittedly so, but we know that tests are for the proving of our character so that we lack nothing. Thank you for Jesus, the true and better Isaac, bound upon the wood, carrying the wood himself, caught in the thicket, bound for our transgressions, substitute, atonement. And thank you, Father, that your plan, your plan which was set in time, before the ages began was carried out and on that mountain it was provided salvation to everyone who calls on the name of the Lord and we give you praise.